So our next speaker joins us uh, all the way from Ottawa. He is the leader of our Canadian labor movement, Hassan Youssef, president of the Canadian Labor Congress. Uh, Hassan has uh, served four terms uh, as secretary treasurer of uh, the CLC uh, and uh, two terms as CLC vice president and he is completing his first term as president. Uh, Hassan came to Canada from Guyana in South America and as a, young, uh, as a young new Canadian, he found work uh, at the, Can, uh, the CanCar plant in Toronto uh, and became active in his union, the Canadian Auto Workers. Uh, since that time, he's obviously risen through the ranks and he has established himself as an internationally recognized trade union leader uh, who fights passionately uh, for human rights, uh, the environment, and of course, uh, his central passion, workers' rights. Please join me, join me in welcoming uh, our colleague, our friend, the leader of the Canadian Labour Movement, Hassan Youssef. I apologize. I've, I've, I've put Hassan on the spot because I actually didn't read my own agenda, or at least I didn't read it properly, but uh, Hassan is a very good sport. And uh, he rolls with the punches, and this is what good leaders do. So I've thrown him a curveball, and he uh, very ably has caught it. So uh, please, <laughs> I apologize, Sad, but thanks for, uh, for joining us today. Yeah, yeah, I don't think he means any bloody thing about apology. <laughs> uh, first and foremost, let me um, start by thanking you guys for inviting me. It's an honor to be at your convention especially after the many decades of the hard work to change the direction of this province. I can't begin to tell you when I wake up in the morning and think that Alberta is run by socialists. <laughs> and I really want to thank uh, Gil. I know the, it's much harder being a president when you have a sitting government. And him, Siobhan, and the hard work that has to now go on in regard to, to building that relationship and maintaining that relationship because, you know, Given all the years we were denied progress in this province, we're kind of a little bit in a hurry. So I could understand the challenges you face, but I also want to commend you on all the work you're doing, of course, um, and preparing for the many things that's happening in this province. I know that um, it's an incredible journey as we work with the new government in this province, of course, to advance the challenges of working people. You know, and I watched Rachel dealing with the sexism in the legislature and the ongoing, of course, uh, trolls that harass her and speak out. It also reminds us, despite all the good work we have done in our movement, how much more we have to do. Because it's still not an equal world for women, in, not only in this province, but throughout this country and throughout the world. And we've got a lot more to do to take on that issue politically, as sisters and brothers, and we can't allow it, of course, to happen. We finally have a government to stand up for our values in this province, and I can't tell you how pleased I am because it makes some of the work we're doing at the national level that much easier. You know, when Rachel announced that she was going to implement a $15 minimum wage, all the idiots in the world are screaming, the world, the economy is going to come to an end. By the way, last month figure, you created 20,000 full-time jobs. <clears throat> But it still will not stop them from saying, of course, some of the crazy things they continue to do that. Um, it's also, of course, the improvement to early childhood education that the province is doing. And I want to thank, of course, the Gill and the Federation for the Fair Start campaign you continue to, to run. Recently, of course, the government announced a pilot project to create another 1,300 new affordable childcare spaces for women in this province and families who have been struggling, of course, to find meaningful childcare spaces, and I can't begin to tell you how important that is. On the issue on tuition fees for poor secondary education, and the, the tremendous of, of work, of course, the government continued to do, of course, to work with public sector to ensure that workers can sit down and negotiate, of course, a fair collective agreement. Sisters Brothers is envious, of course, to watch what's going on here. I'm hoping, of course, uh, next week, not next week, the week after, on May the 9th, as we look, sorry, look to Alberta, uh, sorry, uh, BC, uh, hopefully we'll have some friends that may join you here, so it makes it a little bit uh, stronger in terms of what we're trying to build. These are important times, of course, for our movement, and of course, we gotta, of course, strengthen our solidarity, because if we remain strong as a movement, of course, uh, we'll re-elect this government, of course, in uh, 2000, uh, spring of 19, is it, if I'm right? Spring of 19? Yep, to, spring of 19. 
And we will do everything to work with the Federation of Labor to ensure, of course, the Rachel Notley government get reelected. Sisters and brothers, this is going to be hard work. I don't have any doubt in my mind, but I looked at a poll yesterday that I saw online, and um, we're in a good place. You know, given what's happening with the economy, if that should continue, of course, and the incredible good work the government is doing, um, I think, of course, we, we can get there. But we're also going to have to take on the huge and the challenge, of course, in convincing our own members and the political work that's going to require to make sure we've got a great plan on how we're going to mobilize in the specific riding where we elect members the last time and how we're going to ensure we can get our members and their family out to support our sisters and brothers who are in the legislature who have done so much for us. But at the same time, I really want to also spend some time to talk to you about some of the victories we've been able to have at the national level uh, since I was here the last time. You know, in 2015, the Supreme Court made some important decisions and continue in that uh, direction. We now, and for the first time in the history of our country since 1982, when we patriate the Constitution, we now have won the right to strike, of course, the fundamental right protected by the Constitution in this country. We always knew there was a fundamental right. You just couldn't get the legislatures across this country to recognize it. Now that the highest court in the land has ruled, we've got to ensure the politician does not trample on that right very lightly. We also run the right to collective bargain and the right to organize. The right to join a union is now a fundamental right, of course, protected by the Constitution of this country. And I know the work that you are doing here for labor reform is absolutely important. I keep saying every single day, it is no business of the boss to interfere in the right of a worker who wants to join a union, fundamentally. Why should the employer be interfering in such a fundamental right that's now protected by the Constitution? Other than, of course, to poison the workplace, threaten workers with their livelihood, and get them to change their minds. If this is a fundamental right, we also need the legislature for workers to sign a card so we can have card checks so more workers can join the labor movement, not having to go through that threat. Why is this important? You don't have to sign a card if you don't want to join a union. But for those workers who make that choice, and it's 50% of one that should do so, the union should be certified in the workplace. We've had that legislation at the national level for 60 years until Stephen Harper took it away. And I'm hoping between now and uh, before we start the CLC convention, we will restore car certification at the national level again. We work, of course, with this federation and the work we did across this country in public hearings and working with the Council of Canadians and a number of other friends across this country to stop this Trans-Pacific Partnership. I don't know if it's completely dead, but it's dead for now, and I think we should celebrate that victory. And sisters and brothers, we've been working on something which has been very much a challenge to our movement. For decades now, we have struggled, of course, to get the federal government to ban both the import and export of asbestos. Last year, December the 15th, the federal government finally announced they will bring in a comprehensive ban to ban both the import and export of asbestos, a substance that kills some 200 Canadians in this country every single year. No fault of their own. They went to work. The workplace could have been contaminated, like somebody like me who was a mechanic, worked with asbestos. And, of course, this will continue for some time yet because if you have asbestos embedded in your lungs, you can't get it out. And of course, that stats has been continuous to climb. 2,000 Canadians die every single year. We've been working, of course, to get the government to have a national registry for all federal public building, own or lease that contain asbestos. So the workers who work in those facilities should know, have a right to know. We also try to get them to sign on to the Rotterdam Convention. This is an international convention that will list the asbestos that we used to produce, Chrysotile asbestos, the carcinogen. Right now, of course, the conference is taking place in Geneva. And of last Friday, the federal government announced they will sign on to that convention the first time in the history since that convention has been established. This is, of course, an important victory for working people because it will make workplace safer in the future. But we've got a lot more work to do. Your federation, along with Gil, of course, uh, we have worked for over a decade to expand the Canada Pension Plan. In June of 2016, the federal government announced a 33% in the increase of the Canada Pension Plan starting in 2018. That's our victory, my friends. That's our victory. 
This is the first time in 50 years we're increasing the Canada Pension Plan. Who will be the greatest benefactors of this? Are the young people who are starting out to work today. Many of them who are not fortunate to work in a unionized environment and may not likely to have a workplace pension. My daughter is likely to be, be, be the greatest benefactor. She's eight years old. By the time she gets to an adult and she starts working, I don't know what her future is going to look like. 11 million people, by the way, go to work every single day in our country and don't have a pension plan other than the CPP. 11 million. 66% of the workforce in this country. And the work we took on for eight years was absolutely the hardest work we've ever done. We had to build public support for this work. We had to build political support for this work. And more importantly, we had to bring the federal government on side. We had to, of course, educate our members. It was one of the best campaign I think we took on in the history of the Congress. I can't begin to tell you the importance of that victory. Because it also makes workers in this country recognize it is a labor movement who has the capacity and the leadership to fight to improve these public policies. This may be the biggest social victory we've had in decades in this country, what we were able to do. At the same time in 2016, the federal government keep their commitment, which we have lobbied them hard and got them to put in their platform, is to roll back OAS and GIS from 67 to 65. An important victory for working people again. And they did one of the most important things I'm very proud of. They gave the poorest citizen in our country, the moms and the dad, the grandparents who have worked their lifetime in this country to help build Canada, who are getting GIS, no fault of their own. They gave them a 10% increase in the GIS payment. I happen to know one of those recipients. She's my mom. This year, she will be 93 years of age. She got a $73 increase in her paycheck. And I know what, she was sitting there at the Thanksgiving table and asking me a question and saying, I got an increase in my GIS check. Do you know anything about it? I said, no, I haven't got a clue, mom. <laughs> I think the government think you deserve a raise. And from where I sit, I think you deserve a raise. But do you know the important thing about that? For all these seniors who got that increase, every penny of that money goes right back in the economy. It's not going to be held in some foreign bank account. These are the people who helped build this country. We owe them a debt of gratitude for their sacrifice to make this country a great place for all of us. When we started a campaign, we said very simply, we need to increase GIS by 15%. We finally were able to get as close to that. I think we were 14 point something percent. And we took that on because we recognize we have the capacity as an organization as we talk about fairness for all Canadian workers, what we wish for ourselves, we desire for all. And the only way you can do that is by the campaign we were able to run to make that happen. Sisters and brothers, very shortly also, the legislation is back in the House because the Senate did an amendment to what is called Bill C-4 uh, to get rid of Bill C-377. This year would mark six years since we started the work to, of course, to stop 377. Six years of hard work. And despite Harper's best effort, by the way, that legislation never saw the light today. And hopefully very soon, it will be a history in the history books of our country. <laughs> Had it not been for our work, we would spend decades filling out stupid reports to tell the federal government how we spend our money. And why do they want to know this? What they really wanted to know, how we were doing our political work. I said back then, I continue to say it, no government ever in this country will take away our fundamental right to do the political work to represent our members. Legislation or no legislation, we will defy it. Whatever they do, we will defy it. So sisters and brothers, as you're about to embark, I know some of you will be coming to the CLC convention in a, another week from now, you'll be in Toronto. We're also recognizing that you simply can't talk about the things that you've been successful about in doing on behalf of our movement. We have to look to the future, and there are many, many challenges that we're going to be faced as we're going forward as a movement. And we want to spend some time to talk about the challenges we're going to face. On the first day of the convention, we'll talk about fairness. During the convention, and the second day, we'll talk about equality, and green jobs, and climate change, and organizing. Why is this important? Good jobs is still a challenge for many, many Canadians in this country. Some four million Canadians in this country work for minimum wage. 
go to work full time just like me and you, and they don't make enough money, of course, to meet their basic needs. There's something fundamentally wrong when somebody could work full time and not have enough money to meet their basic needs. That because the minimum wage in too many parts of our country is set so low and people are living in poverty at the end of the day. How do we create quality jobs in this country? What is the role for us to push our national governments and our provincial governments to do more? And the fight for 15 right across this country is such an important. For those 4 million Canadians, the labor movement has been working tirelessly to ensure this issue gets the support it needs to ensure they can have a better opportunity. But also as we look to the future, the future of work as I speak to you are changing dramatically. Technology is interrupting every single thing we do. And we're going to have to figure out how we can respond to it. You will hear Guy Ryder, from, Director General from the ILO, will speak to the convention about the future of work. And I can tell you everywhere I go, this is the number one concern. I recently looked at a study where some 35% of the jobs that exist today will disappear because of technological advances. 35% of the jobs. What will replace those jobs? What's our strategy for attracting new members into our movement? How do we look to the future to figure out that our employment standard laws don't even cover the basic, give workers the basic protection today? These are things we're going to have to, of course, challenge yourself with and figure out how we're going to lean on it. You know, as our country, of course, will celebrate this 150 years uh, this July the 1st, our country has changed dramatically what it used to be. It's more diverse. As I speak to you, women make up more than half the workforce today in the economy, more than half. Pay equity is a fundamental underpinning. If we want women to get equality in their income, pay equity is a fundamental right that has to be embraced by every government across this land. How do we open up our structures to attract more workers of color and give them spaces in our organization? How do we create more spaces for indigenous workers in our country so they can feel part of our movement as they continue in some parts of the country to join our workforce? How do we also ensure that our workplaces are safe for LGBTQ members to work with an organization? And how do we do more, of course, to ensure we can accommodate workers with disability? These are the challenges, and I keep saying constantly, diversity is not a weakness, this is our strength. If we can embrace it and build on it, we can grow our movement and make, of course, our movement that much stronger. <clears throat> you know, right here in Alberta, you're having a very, very important debate, and that debate is about what is the balance between natural resources, e exploitation, and the environment. I always believe there is no contradiction with these two issues. The environment and, and of course, resource are two things that can exist, coexist. But at the same time, we also have to deal with the most fundamental challenge of humanity we've ever had to deal with, climate change. It's not something you can wish away like that idiot in the United States <laughs> talking about clean coal. There is no such thing as clean coal. There's coal. And of course, it creates some huge hazards for the environment. The reality is we need to build a different kind of economy going forward that's going to look at how we can deal with transitional issues. How do we retrofit all the homes in our country that was built way back when we didn't have the technology and the kind of things that we know today that can make a house much more efficient? How do we expand our public transportation system across this country? And why in 2017 are we still riding on a railway system that was built back in Dr. Zhivago era? When countries are having high speed rate, they move at 325 kilometers an hour. This is a technology created by Bombardier, yet we can't put that technology in our country. And how do we unionize in the sectors where the new jobs are going to come in solar installation for workers who can work in those industries? This is a serious debate, and it's not a debate that needs to fracture our movement. It's a debate that we need to embrace together as a union family, recognizing we all have a, contribu a contribution to make in this debate. I, for one, believe we're not going to duck this issue, and we're going to put it on the agenda of the CLC Convention. We're going to have a good discussion. Because when we leave there, I'm hoping in 2018, we can have a national conference where we bring workers across this country together to talk about how do we build this new future economy where the labor movement is playing a central role, but at the same time, we're doing our part for the future generation so we can reduce our greenhouse gases and don't, of course,
create the challenges that humanity might, might not be able to, re to, 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 to reverse. I have a young daughter, and I know I have to do my part, but we also have to do our part in the trade union movement. And I say this among friends and colleagues. I think we can have clearly a united front on this issue, and we don't have to have the divisions we have seen too often in movements in other places. And I can tell you one thing for sure. I will work closely with your federation and your president to ensure there's no division in our movement against your province and the things that you produce here against the rest of the country. <clears throat> the work that you are doing here on just transition for coal workers is fundamental. I have to say, by the way, that's an extremely great document that you've produced. We're going to take parts of this and use it for our work we're doing in the Congress because you provide many opportunities for people to look at what has been the past experience of communities have gone through transition. How have workers been treated? What happened to those communities? Can we learn from them and do better? You know, throughout our history as a, as a labor movement, we've been transitioning. But for most of the transition we've been doing, we had no say in it. The boss didn't ask her, her opinion when they shut down the workplace and discard workers. They simply said, sorry, your job don't exist. If we have an opportunity to shape the future, we should take hold of that. We can't be outside the room where the debate is happening. We have to be at the room, we have to be at the table. Be an equal voice with the employers and government to say we have something to contribute to this debate. If we're gonna meet our target to reduce greenhouse gases, then workers and the labor movement have to be a fundamental part of that debate. Otherwise, it won't will not happen. <laughs> the last issue, of course, we'll spend some time talking about the convention is density. We have been fortunate in our country. We're one of the countries that have held density now for over 30 years at 30%. It's been our strength. It's what gives us political influence and our ability to, of course, to push back on hard right-wing governments that have attacked us over the years. But we simply can't rest on our laurels and think that's going to be there forever. We've now got to put effort and says, how do we grow the labor movement? What's it going to require in terms of new strategies? Centrals don't have the responsibility to organize workers, but there's other things we can do to support our affiliates in this effort. And I think we need to have that debate, because if we're not careful, we could start slipping from our 30% density to a lower. We watch our American friends going through a huge challenge as their density keep dropping. Politicians stop listening to them and keep ignoring them. We don't want to get there. And I think our density has helped us with, with, with strength, I think we can have a good discussion about what we're gonna to need to do as a labor movement across this country to raise our density. What would we do, of course, to what legislation do we need? Well, that's an important part. It's not the only part, of course, that we need to put together. What different strategies can we embrace how we promote our movement? And the last thing I'll talk to you about is the kind of conversation we need with our members and our families and our community. And that's where the fairness campaign comes in. You see, too often when the public look at us, they think we're selfish. All we care about is ourselves, and we've got to find a way to tell that story, all the good things we do all the time to make this country a better place for working people. You know, the Canada Pension Plan would never have been, a, uh, of course, improved if we didn't take on that fight as a labor movement. We've got to find a way to tell that story. We spend millions of dollars of our own resources on that issue. Why? Because we believe every Canadian deserves a better pension plan in this country. If you spend a lifetime working, you should not have to retire in poverty. It's as simple as that. <laughs> but also, sisters and brothers, the hard work is a conversation you need to have in the workplace with your co-worker, your sisters and brothers who work right beside you, about the value of the union, about their involvement in the union. You see, long time ago, when I was a young lad, when I first joined the labor movement, not by choice, by the way, I joined it because I wanted to get, make more money. Didn't come from a union family, didn't know anything about unions, and then somebody asked me to go to a union meeting. And his name was Bill Merlin. He came one time, he said, the Sand, there's a union meeting on Sunday at one o'clock. I looked at him, kind of, Sunday at one o'clock, really, seriously? I said, no, I don't, sorry, thank you, but uh, I don't think so. A month later, he came back, I said, we're having a meeting, and I said, Sunday at one o'clock. He said, you remember? I said, no, I remember the first time. He said, why can't you come to the meeting? I said, well, it's kind of an issue I got. 
I said, well, let me tell you the truth. I get paid on Friday. I get drunk on Friday. I get drunk on Saturday. I recover on Sunday, and I come back to work on Monday. I can't be at a union meeting on Sunday because I'm not in any state to be at a union meeting. Bill didn't say a word. One month later, came the same thing. He said, we're having a union meeting. Sunday at 1 o'clock at Runnemey and Sinclair. He said, yeah, some strange reason I went to that meeting. And the rest is history. But here's the important point. Bill never judged me about my behavior. He just keep coming to me to ask me to go to that meeting. My point is, there's a lot of members like me, by the way, in the workplace. For whatever reason, they don't attend. That doesn't, I don't think it means they're disinterested. We've got to find a way to have a conversation with them. Because the great work of the union, it just doesn't rest on just one or two people. It rests on all of us. We have to broaden that conversation. Like the ones you have to have at your family table with that crazy brother-in-law or sister-in-law, the Hayes unions. But they come to the Thanksgiving dinner table. Sometimes you just got to interrupt the dinner and say, excuse me, we're going to have that conversation. I had a brother-in-law who told me one day when Rob Ford was the mayor of Toronto, did he love Rob Ford? And I thought, did I just hear what he said? I did not been for my sister. I think I was going to strangle him. But I figured I might as well talk to him. And I had to talk to him and keep talking to him that Rob Ford was no friend of working people. Was it hard? I didn't want to do that. Actually, it was family day in Ontario in February. Like family, I'm having this, this discussion with my brother-in-law about Rob Ford. But my only point is, sisters and brothers, this is the hard job we have to do. So let me get to the next point. Now, not that long ago, I know some people are young in the audience, but there are a lot of older people. You remember when this thing didn't exist? And when it didn't exist, we didn't know how to talk to each other. We used to have to pick up the phone, we send you a fax, maybe. We write you a letter, you got it in the mail a couple of weeks later. But this thing changed our lives. And we haven't yet learned how to use it effectively to build our movement. We've got to get a better program. Because this is extremely important. A lot of our members have it. The fundamental question, why wouldn't they give us their email address? By the way, they give it to everybody else. And as a labor movement, we have to have those discussions because the point is we do so much and our members need to take some ownership to that, and we've got to find a way, and this is, of course, the world has changed. It's not going to go back to the way it was. Some people love to come to union meetings. I do, but a lot don't. They live, many, they live too far. They've got other issues to deal with. But can we get the information to them? Hey, you never know, they might just read it and decide to do something about it. The reason I'm raising this with you, because I do believe if we're truly going to, of course, improve our relationship with our members, it has to start with a conversation. And each one of us have to take on that conversation with our own members. And when we do, by the way, you might get just lucky and discover somebody like me. Because Bill Merlin didn't know whatever was going to go to a meeting. But he never gave up on me. He just kept coming and asking. Hey, he's saying, come to the meeting. And finally, one Sunday, I decided I'm not going to get drunk that Saturday night so I can be sober and go to that meeting. And all of a sudden, it opened my eyes. Hey, this union thing, I can get into it. And it made a difference. Sisters and brothers, I conclude, I really want to say to all of you, I know the challenges ahead that we're going to have to take on. I know the hard work that the Federation is constantly having to, of course, um, pull people together. But that unity is even more so today than it is at any time. Because if we remain strong, when they didn't think we can win, when Rachel Notley got elected on that beautiful night, we can do that again. But we're going to have to bring the rest of our members with us and bring our neighbors with us, and bring our friends with us, and our family members. We have the numbers to make this happen. This is not rocket science. But the reality is going to take hard work, and each one of us is going to have to take that on. Otherwise, you're going to go back to the 40 years of history, where those assholes who run this province think there was no alternative. There is an alternative. You've seen it. It's right before you. A government, despite the worst economic situation they could possibly find themselves in, they're doing everything to defend the interests of working people, because they understand. So let me conclude, and I want to thank again Gil for his hard work and Siobhan for the hard work of the Federation and all the staff. Also, I want to recognize 
two of my staff that is here. Uh, Dar uh, Darla, could you stand up, or Prairie Director? <laughs> and of course, uh, Corey Longo is your rep in Alberta. Sisters and brothers, it's an honor to be here this week with you, of course, for the, to, to, of course, with the convention and the hard work you'll take on. But also, I look forward to seeing you, many of you at the CLC convention. I just want to say I will be with you that entire journey as we continue to work as hard as we can to ensure we make this province the most progressive place in this country. Thank you so much. Before we, let, uh, before we let Hassan go, I just wanted to um, give a couple of personal thank yous to Hassan. Uh, I, I want to thank him uh, for his support uh, as, as a leader, leader to leader. He's always been there uh, whenever I make a phone call, he makes himself available. Uh, but he's also been a big supporter of provincial federations and uh, regional and local labor councils. So even though he's focused on those big national issues, He's always made time uh, for regional and local issues, and we're a stronger movement uh, because we have a leader at the top that understands that the foundation needs to be strong. Uh, I also want to thank Hassan um, for his style of leadership. It's a style of leadership uh, that puts the, the member at the center. So even though, uh, actually a lot of us in this room have titles where we're presidents, we're secretary treasurers, we're uh, executive board members. Uh, but what Hassan remembers, and uh, he, he actually lives this credo, is that our strength is in our membership. And, uh, and, he, and to have a leader at the top uh, who understands that we are um, a, a movement of members, uh, that makes a really big difference. Re related to that, related to that, it's also important to, that um, Hassan understands that uh, we are an activist movement. Uh, we're not just institutions. Uh, we're not just names on the paper. Uh, we have real power and real potential power, but we only mobilize that power uh, by coming together, uh, educating our members, mobilizing our members, and engaging in activism. That's our real power, uh, and we can change the world with that power, and uh, it's really important to have a leader at the top who understands that. And uh, so finally, I want to thank, uh, I want to thank uh, Hassan for his friendship for his leadership, uh, his willing to pursue, uh, like, like a dog with a bone, <laughs> some really important campaigns uh, that have benefited working people, not just union members, but all working Canadians, most notably the campaign on CPP. Uh, this is a campaign that uh, Hassan has taken the lead on uh, for more than a decade, and, and this year it bore fruit. So I just, on behalf of our federation, I want to thank you for taking the lead on that campaign. And, uh, and, and finally, I just want to say that Hassan's always looking for the next thing. We won on CPP, uh, but now he's agreed, uh, and he's played a leadership role in embracing a campaign that was actually initiated by the, the nurses uh, to make uh, our next big push as a labor movement uh, to win a universal national pharmacare pro uh, program in this country. And that's something that the nurses have been talking about for years, but under Hassan's leadership has now become a priority of the entire labor movement. So, so thank you for being here. Thank you for addressing our, uh, our delegates. Thank you for your leadership. And on behalf of our delegation and our federation, we wish you the best of your luck in your convention next week. Okay, thanks.